tell you what, I have a thing, regardless of how much prayer has gone on, when I sit here to teach the people of God, I have got to still invoke God's help. It's just something I have to do. And sometimes I've gone into these great big churches, like in Europe especially, and they are not real to help on one, women teachers anyway, but they're beginning to accept the fact because there's so many of us, you know. And, and so, but these old precious pastors will come. And, I mean, they don't know, you know, what they're letting loose in their pulpit. And so they come and they pray and they pray and they pray over you. And then they said, all right, sister, kind of shakingly, how, take your liberty, you know. <laughs> and uh, anyway, um, I still have to pray for myself. And it's so embarrassing. After all of that, I will very quickly pray for myself, you know. I just have to do it. It's the way I slip into whatever it is that teaches through me. <laughs> I hope it's the gift of teaching, okay, for your sakes. But it's what, it, to, to slip into that flow, I've got to pray for myself. And so, Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you now, Lord, for stirring up the gift. I thank you, Lord, for releasing the word under the unction of the Holy Spirit. I thank you, Lord, for letting it go forth in power, Father, into the hearts of your people. Thank you, Father. And we take authority over any kind of hindering force or spirit in the heavenlies above us that would want to distract or interfere or rob any single person from hearing what they need to hear in the message. And so, Father, that means that you must speak through me. And I pray, Lord, that as a yielded vessel, you would find me sanctified and meet for your use and speak your things through me today. And I thank you for it humbly. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to be looking at another example of intercession. And let me tell you, it's the next class where we begin to get into the nuts and bolts of intercession. But we're just set looking at some scriptural uh, examples that we have of mighty intercessors so that we can emulate them. And the next example of intercession is going to be seen in Exodus 17, but don't turn there yet. We're going to look at something. But it's a, a biblical example that we as students of prayer need to understand. It opens up for us how the unseen spiritual world goes into action as we struggle in prayer. And the clash of the unseen worlds is an incredible thing when we understand what's going on when we get serious in our prayer life. Uh, and the fact that amazes us is that we have authority to influence these places that we haven't, didn't even know they were there. And I don't know if, if Moses knew about it. I don't know if Daniel understood. But when he prayed, it happened. And when you pray, it's happened. It's been happening if you've been praying. Remember that we consider this portion of scripture before, and it's sort of like a foundation stone in what we're teaching. Please, Father, help my throat tonight. Amen. And it's Revelation 12, verses 7 through 11. We saw it before, but we're going to look at it again. Just to be, I am going to try to talk with a fisherman's friend. Not a real person, just a fisherman's friend in my mouth. Just pray I don't suck in, and if I do, someone give me the hymen thing, you know. Okay. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought against his angels. Remember, we looked at this the first day. And this is not something, as the churches have taught down through the church age, that happened way back when Satan was cast out of heaven. This is not talking about that. This is talking about a war where Satan is being pushed off the thrones he seized in the fall of Adam. We discussed that in the first message. And they fought, and his angels prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent, called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength, 
and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, and loved not their lives unto the death. So God's angels and Satan's angels fight until finally the good angels defeat the bad angels. And we notice that it is the brethren, however, that get the victory. And they get it because of what they're doing down on earth. Um, the blood, the word, and not loving their lives to the death. When I was in Guatemala teaching, I taught on this at an aglo meeting in Guatemala City, the capital. And a lady was there that was a, a lady that was in the government. She was a secretary of state or something. She was very high official in the government. And when I'd finished teaching this, she said, now I understand a vision I had. This was in the 80s, in the mid 80s. And Guatemala had, in the early 80s, elected a very wonderful Christian president. And the Christians were so happy. And he had been overwhelmed with a lot of things and had been, ca and had been put out of office. His stay in the presidency was very brief. And this, this is what the woman said. She said, I never understood it. She said, as I was coming in, the government building was a huge, beautiful building that was like two blocks long, you know. And I was coming into this building to my job. And suddenly I saw over the top of the building, now it was a long, low building. I would say it was not more than four stories high. But anyway, over the top, I saw clouds and I was having a vision and I saw angels which were obviously the angels of God and they were warring against angels that had to be the angels of Lucifer and the war was so intense and and the angels of Lucifer won over the angels of God and she said Lord how can this be this cannot be a vision from you how can the devil defeat God's angels she never knew she said now I understand and I explained to her, I said, when we get someone in office, we've got to cover them with prayer. And I said, it, because the powers of darkness are against them, incalculable pressure coming against these men that are in high places and authority. So anyway, I don't know that they've ever gotten another Christian leader there. But if they ever do, they know, even now, I, I brought out, that if you'll pay, pray for the ones that are wicked, it will curb them in and they can't do things that will hurt the people of God. Okay. Now, it says the word of their testimony. We need to know this is not the kind of a testimony that we might give in church or Sunday night service, for example. It's a proclamation of what the blood has done for me. It's personal, what I know about the blood, how it's brought deliverance in my life. We have to proclaim. We're not doing it to God. This is a proclamation to the enemy. Let me tell you, you pray to God, spiritual warfare is when you turn and address the enemy. You don't ask God to do it. You do it. You take authority. You have it. Don't say, God, please do this. You do it. That's spiritual warfare. But you get in the spirit. You get in that place. But then you turn and confront the enemy with truth. Okay. So we proclaim to the accuser. Our only answer, of course, to the accusations of the enemy is the blood of Jesus. And that we're standing not in what we are, but what he is. We cannot ever think we can stand on any of our merits or our past laurels. We stand only in the righteousness accounted to us through his blood. Because the first thing he's going to do is attack you. If you've got a weak place, he's going to explode that thing. And you know what it says? If my heart condemns, I can't pray. In other words, I have no authority with God if my heart is condemning me. Thank God, God is greater than our hearts, it says. But you have to know the devil is going to condemn you. Remember, anything that condemns, I want to give you a word of wisdom. Anything that comes at you condemning is never God. God 
is a God that can say anything in the world to you that's wrong in your life without condemning you. Right. He can expose it and you can say, oh, so that's what's been wrong, you know. But the devil will condemn and it's a heavy load. Okay. And that's what the accuser does, of course. The angels, as I said before, are spiritual muscles of our prayer. We're here on earth and the angels of God are up in the realm where the bad angels are. And they act in our behalf when we stand on the word of God. And as we said before, this war is going on all the time. When God's people proclaim the victory of Jesus, God's angels can fight. And we must, but we must vocalize. It ha we have to speak it. We can't think it. We have to vocalize what the blood of Jesus has done. And as I said before, we confront our enemy with the knowledge of the truth. Satan works. He will never come and preach the gospel to you. And they say, you, you know, I was defeated. Why are you letting me do this to you? You know, he, he works in the darkness of human ignorance. And he assumes you're ignorant unless you vocalize what you know. Right. Remember that. We've got to let him know that we know he's been defeated. Now we have a, pic a picture of this invisible battle in Exodus 17 and we're going to begin there tonight, this afternoon. Exodus 17, we're going to begin with verse 8. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel at Rephaim, at Rephaim. and Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go out, fight with Amalek tomorrow. I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on one side, the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomforted Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. We're going to stop there for a moment. Of course, the rod is a type of the word of God. It says the rod shall go forth out of Zion. It's that word of power. It's, a, it's the authority, the word of authority. Okay, another point here. Sometimes we have battles that go on forever. We've got to have yoke fellows that will stand with us. Rather than giving up, it's better to have a brother or sisters come and help lift up our hands. That's where it comes from, this scripture right here, lifting up the hands. Um, so here we see something. Joshua is a figure. We're, we're looking into the unseen world. Yes, this was a real battle. But it's also a picture, a type of something that we have here in, in the Bible. Joshua is a p figure of the angels of God, the armies of heaven. Amalek is a figure of Satan and his angels. And as long as the intercessor held out his hands... Satan's angels could not prevail as long as that happened. And so we see that they finally did prevail in that situation. But Moses, verse 15, Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nissi. For he said, because the Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Now that tells us it's more than just a natural story. From generation to generation. It's like I said when we looked at Revelation 12. This war has been going on. It's still going on. And so this is obviously a figure of something more than a natural battle that was held in that valley a long time ago. However, in natural history, Amalek did continue to discomfort Israel again and again. But just for, just for the sake of history, we're going to see what finally became of him. But 
But when the Lord said build an altar because this is going on from generation to generation, he was referring more to the spiritual battle that we have with the angels of darkness that are always trying to, dis you know, to destroy us. Okay. We're going to see the end of Amalek. Let's look at 1 Samuel 15. The end of Amalek was also, unfortunately, the end of Saul. Okay, we're going to just read a few verses, number of verses in this chapter, and we're going to see verse 1 through 3. And Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore, in other words, you have been appointed as a leader over this people. Now therefore, hearken unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. We just read about that, you see. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. Okay. Now, why did you think Samuel reminded him of his holy calling from God as a king because Amalek was rich and it would be a great temptation for Saul knowing his character to keep some stuff for himself but he said everything destroy it all okay now we're going to start with verse 9 I'm sorry verse 7 in the same chapter and Saul smote Amalek the Amalekites from Havilah until they come as to Shur and over against Egypt. And he took Agog, Agog, the king of the Amalekites. He took him alive. Wasn't he supposed to kill him? And utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agog, Agog and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fatlings and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them but everything that was vile and refuse they destroyed okay verse 13 and Samuel came to Saul <clears throat> and Saul said unto him blessed be thou of the Lord I have performed the commandment of the Lord and Samuel said what meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear. And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God. And the rest we have utterly destroyed. In other words, he blamed it on the people, didn't he? Okay. Now, verse, we'll, we'll go to verse 17 to start. And Samuel said, When that was little in thine own eyes, that was was thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners of Amalekites and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord and didst fly upon the spoil and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? Well, we know the story. He blamed the people and that was when... Uh, Samuel ripped his garment and said, the kingdom has left you because of this. But now let's read what happened to Agog, uh, the king. It's very interesting. Verse 32. Then said Samuel, bring me ye hither to me, Agog, the king of the Amalekites. And Agog came unto him delicately. And Agog said, surely the bitterness of death is past. And Samuel said, as thy sword hath made women childless, so shall thy mother be childless among the women. And Samuel hewed Agog in pieces before the Lord of Gilgal. That's a terrible thing. And I know you know that story. I just wanted to touch on it. It's, it's just important <clears throat> to be obedient in all things with the Lord. Now Moses is seen 
And may God give me the tongue of the learned as I talk about this man. He is seen as one of the most powerful intercessors on earth ever, apart from our Lord, who laid down his life for us and now ever lives to make intercession for us at the right hand of God. We will consider the times that Moses stood alone before God, asking God to spare Israel. Often he stood in the gap for that nation. He was the only one that God could look to. And this term gap is one of those words that I've come to love. It's just a word when you know what it means biblically, and I'm sure most of you do. It's just a word that is one of those special words. A gap is something that's created by sin. So let's turn and read where it's mentioned in Ezekiel in Ezekiel 22, verses 30 and 31. And God is talking this when the land of Israel is falling. Actually, Jerusalem is falling, the land of Judah. And God is talking. He says, And I sought a man among them that should make up the hedge, and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it. But I found none. Therefore have I poured out my indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, saith the Lord. Now, as we said, a gap is created by sin. It's a hole in the hedge where the enemy can come in to kill and destroy the people. In, Ezek in Ecclesiastes 10.8, it says, If we make a hole in our hedge, a serpent will bite us. Now, of course, it's talking about a hedge like in Florida. It's true. <laughs> Get a hole in your fence and a serpent will come in. But it's talking about far more than that, we know. Isaiah 5 is a scripture that a lot of people don't know, but let's turn there for a moment. We're only going to read two verses. Isaiah 5 is a picture of God's vineyard which is Old Testament vineyard, and we have a New Testament vineyard. But both of them had certain provisions of God. Let's read it. Now I will sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My beloved hath a vineyard and a very fruitful hill. And he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with a choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press therein and he looked that it should bring forth grapes and it brought forth wild grapes okay in that word it says it fenced it it says it actually in hebrew is that he hedged it in he made a wall around it and uh, this is a picture of the church actually the people of god the blood washed people you're very safe in a church and people say, you know, I can be religious and close to God all by myself. That's true. But you don't have the same provision of God that you do when you're in a fellowship with other saints. Because as long as we're in the church age, God has appointed certain protections over the church that are not out there when you're in your house by yourself. What is it? It's got a wall around it. It's planted, of course, you're the choicest vine that's been planted with. In the midst of it, in another place it says there's a watchtower in it. That's in the New Testament. But that means there's a prophetic word going forth to show you things that are coming so that you can take care. You know, their warning system in the local church. But the thing I want you to know, and this is a rabbit trail, we'll get back very soon. It's got a wine press in it. And that's why most people leave the local church. Because there are problems in the local church. And they say... You know, it's not, it's horrible. It's a wine press. What is a wine press? It's not, it squeezes the grapes, not the vine. It squeezes the grapes to see how their fruit is, if it's sweet or sour. In other words, do you have fruit of the Spirit? In every local church, there are going to be things that will test your sanctification. If you're sanctified, you're going to stay there and pray through. But if you're not, you're going to run and you'll meet the wine press again and again and again. We have, we call them cruisomatics. I'm sorry, I don't want to step on toes. But we have people in our area and they left our church mad and they went around. About 10 year, years later, here they are again, you know, and they get offended. But 
You know, that's the wine press. It's going to make sure you get conformed to Christ. You get conformed to Christ by rubbing against the other stones that aren't so agreeable. It tests your fruit to see if it's good fruit. Okay, that's my end of my sermon tonight about local churches. Okay, anyway, the local we have a hedge about us if we live for God. Now, I'm not saying you aren't protected if you're out there by yourself. But there's more protection. This is what, I mean, I have four children. They're all married. I have 11 grandchildren. And I say, get in church and stay there. You just have more provision of God. Okay. So, this hole in the hedge means when we make an entrance into our lives... And that's what it means when you're getting deliverance and people say, keep all your doors shut. It means shut the door so the enemy can't come in, these little areas of sin in your life. So Ecclesiastes continues, and it says, if we dig a pit, we'll fall into it. Okay, These are warnings to teach us a principle. If we as God's people sin and do not repent, we open ourselves up to demonic attack. Satan is like a hungry lion that is ever watching for a way to get into your life. A missionary was telling me, and I read this in a book, maybe you read it too, it was some missionary life that I read it, but he was talking about what it was like, what a lion was like when Peter said, Satan is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He lived in Kenya, and he and one of his uh, native buddies had to go out to another village to preach that day. And it was the time of year when lions were really prowling, and he didn't want to leave his wife and children alone, but he did. And they were in a pretty well-built house. It had a straw-thatched roof, you know. And after the men had been gone for a few hours, there came a lion sniffing around the house. He went round and round, sniffing and looking for an entrance. He would scratch. He couldn't get through. The walls were thick. Pretty soon he went up on top, and he went all over looking and seeking, and he pretty soon he started scratching, and he was like scratching through that thatched roof. I mean, it was pretty thick, and he was scratching through it when the woman and her children were crying out to God when that husband and this man came back and they killed that lion. But he would have gotten in and devoured them, you see. But when it says he's like a lion seeking, he's looking for some little entrance. And if it's a little tiny entrance, he gets his paws in there. And pretty soon, you know, what we thought was a little problem we could control is a problem we can't. There's a scripture about that somewhere. Anyway, we, we won't go there. You want to go there? Yes. No? Okay, uh, it's, I, I just remembered where it was. I always finish up earlier than anyone else, so maybe for once I can come fill my time. Let's look at Psalm 100 and, did someone say 6? Did I hear s over there? Anyway, it's, it is Psalm 106. And I said, well, someone's heard me teaching this before. Okay. Okay, talking about getting rid of all sin out of your life. In the Old Testament, it was getting rid of the Canaanites out of the land. And pretty soon they got tired of fighting and they gave up and they coexisted with them. And it says, they did not, verse 34 of Psalm 106, they did not destroy the nations concerning whom they, the Lord commanded them, but were mingled among the heathen and learned their works. And they served their idols, which were a snare unto them. Yea, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils, and shed innocent blood, even the blood of their sons and their daughters, whom they sacrificed unto the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. Thus they defiled with their own works. They were defiled with their own works, and went a whoring with other, their own inventions. Therefore was the wrath of the Lord kindled against his people, insomuch that he abhorred his own inheritance. And he gave them into the hand of the heathen, and they that hated them ruled over them. Their enemies also oppressed them, and they were brought into subjection under their hand. Okay, the ones they didn't get out 
pretty soon we're ruling them. And here's the, here is the principle. Whatever you allow will one day rule over you. It will not stay small. It will not. It will rise up until finally it rules over you. In Ezekiel, we read something important that I want us to consider, that it was their own ways or evil acts coming back on them. Do you remember when it said that in Ezekiel? Do you need to get that on your heart? I want you to get it on your heart. If you're going to be an intercessor, the greatest thing is to see the true heart of God, not just the way he looks from a few scriptures, but to see. It says, in the la last part of verse 31 in Ezekiel 30, uh, 22, their own ways have I recompensed upon their heads, saith the Lord. Their own ways. It was their own evil works falling back on them. It was a reaping of what they had been sowing. The consequences of sin. Every We learned that in science in grammar school or I junior high. For every action, there's a reaction. For every sin, there's a consequence. In Ezekiel, their hedge was down. They were defenseless. They stood in the path of destruction about to come down upon them. We call this the judgment of God. But it isn't actually God taking out a vendetta of anger against them because of their, they're so ungodly. And we mustn't miss that this is not what's happening. It was the direct result of their own evil works that had broken down their hedge of protection. God sees the danger. He, he sees the coming destruction. And what does he do? He doesn't say, well, I tried to teach them better than that. No, it says he looks. He looks for somebody. He's out there looking to find somebody. He doesn't shake his head. He doesn't say, I did all I can for them. They brought it on themselves. No. He looks for someone to stand in the gap to make up the hedge. Wherever that hole is, an intercessor can fill that gap. He can make an appeal for God's mercy to be extended a little bit longer. So why does God need this? I will tell you why. As an intercessor, you need to know these things. Because of Satan, our adversary, God cannot extend his covering of mercy and grace over a wicked people indefinitely. Why? Because Satan stands like an evil lawyer arguing to God against the sinner. He argues against all of us. He demands that God execute justice on these sinners. Yes, Satan demands justice. Now, justice means this. It's terrifying. It means that every person gets exactly what they deserve. It means that one receives full retribution of their acts and all of their consequences. Justice is a two-edged sword. People, we don't want that kind of justice. We, everyone need God's mercy every day. It is like Jeremiah said, it is of the Lord's mercies we're not consumed because him compa his compassions fail not. and They're new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. You see, there's only one thing that can block divine justice. And justice and judgment is the same word. There's only one thing that can block it, and that's divine mercy. The only thing that can balance the scales against it. And that's, you know, we were talking earlier about the throne of God being built on justice and judgment. It's the habitation of his throne. But mercy and truth shall go before his face. Okay, James 2.13 says, Mercy rejoices against judgment. So God looks for someone to stand before him in intercession so that his mercy may be extended over a people who richly deserve judgment. Now, people that aren't in terrible sin do not lead, need someone to stand in the gap for them. 
It's people that deserve judgment that need someone to stand in the gap for them. All sin creates what? Deadly consequences. <laughs> That's why the scriptures warn the wages of sin is death. But in mercy to people, God will hold back the hand of God, holds back consequences as long as it is legally possible. But he cannot in perfect justice, in abiding with his own laws, continue to restrict judgment forever. That's not justice either. So God looks for one, a like feller, to stand in his place to fill the gap. Did y'all know these things already? You're so quiet, I just wondered if I'm just teaching to the choir here. <laughs> Uh, what? Okay, that's good. Okay. This is what Jesus did for us. He stood in the gap for us. He became as one of us. He filled that gap for all of us that we could be spared from the judgment and the consequences of our sins that we richly deserve. We're going to consider now powerful examples where God's rightful judgments were reversed and mercy extended. Because one man, Moses, stood in the gap for Israel. See, God looked for an intercessor. When, it, when Jerusalem was falling and he didn't find one. But he found an intercessor with Moses. So what is an intercessor? You know, we know an intercessor means it's someone that's praying for another. But there's a definition that to me is so precious and of all the definitions of whatever you want to say an intercessor is this is the one that I love because when I'm interceding this is what I feel like I'm doing and let's turn to Job 9.33 did I put this in the syllabus? I don't think so because it's not in I don't have it in I don't have it here either. But anyway, it's Job 9:33. But I think the reason why I was going to share the definition in depth earlier and I decided I would rather save it for this lesson than have it like the lesson yesterday. So anyway, Job 9:33 tells us. Well, he's he's Job is in pain and he's complaining. We'll look at Verse 32, for he's not a man as I am that I should answer him and we should come together in judgment. Neither is there any days man. That means like a lawyer, okay? A lawyer. An, an advocate is a better word. Neither is there any days man betwixt us that might lay his hand upon us both. That is the definition of an intercessor. Job was in great affliction. He cries out to God, and it seems like heavens are shut against him. He has no way to reach through the heavens and touch God as he has in times past. And what he's saying is, only there was an advocate that could reach in for me and touch God and touch me and make that link between us. And I think... Of all the definitions of an intercessor, now forgive me, I get tearful when I'm talking about this. It's pretty much my life, you know. Anyway, he said, to touch God and touch me. And people, when you're praying for someone, literally, you're forming a divine channel through which God's power can pour into that life. Because that person is cut off and has no way of ever breaking through. But through an intercessor, you can touch God and touch him. And that power, I can feel it like a current sometimes. And maybe I'm not touching them in the flesh, but I'm touching them in the spirit. And not only that, not only that, there are whole cities that need this touch. There are whole nations that need this touch. And no matter how wicked a people become, God always extends the possibility of redemption to a people. The psalmist tells us God's desire is not ever to reward us according to our iniquity. 
He does not deal with us after our sins. For as heaven is high above the earth, so is God's mercy toward them that fear him. That's Psalm 103. Yet we as intercessors can stand before God, touch him, the power of the cross, because only through this power of the cross can their sin be pardoned, can their bodies be healed. But we can stand in the behalf of people. We can touch God by faith as priests. And we can sprinkle the blood of sprinkling upon him as priest of God. Prolonging, what are we doing? Prolonging the hour of mercy for them. Binding demonic forces and thereby releasing them to the gentle drawing of God's spirit to find forgiveness for themselves. We can't get saved for them, but we can hold on for them until the spirit of God can do a break. Most people that are in that place are fogged in by demonic forces. They're under such an oppression that the Spirit of God is not able to break through to them. And our pow power is able to restrain those demon powers so the Holy Spirit can come in and do His work. Amen. Right now we're praying for the piercing of the veil of Islam. Those people can't hear God. They can't hear the Holy Ghost. They are smogged in. It's worse than an airport in the middle of a fog storm. You know, it's like the whole, it says, unless the Spirit draw you, you cannot come. Yes. And it's our job as intercessors is to open the way for the Spirit of God. He's the one that will do it. Yes. But we are helpers together with God to hold back those things so the precious dove can lighten their hearts. And in people that have backslidden, they've forgotten the goodness of the Lord. But we can hold back the demons that have blinded them, had taken them captive. And we can't deliver them, but we can hold back those things so that God can reach their innermost being, their hearts. Amen. In Exodus 32, the people have sinned even as the law was being delivered to Moses on Mount Sinai. Down in the valley... I've noticed people are not pronouncing it Mount Sinai. How do you pronounce it? Mount Sinai. Mount, okay, okay, good, okay. D okay, down in the valley below, they made a golden calf and were having a drunken party. The Lord is absolutely grieved with Israel, you see, after all the mighty signs he did. So now we're going to read verse 10 in Exodus 32. I tell you what, I love this man Moses. It's a shame he's already gone, you know. <laughs> that Zipporah, she didn't know what she had. Okay. You know, he's about right. He was over 80. That's good, you know. Okay. Kidding, 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 kidding. Verse 10. So God is mad. And the Lord said unto Moses, this is verse 9, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. Remember what we saw the principle. Amos 4, 7. Surely the Lord God, God does nothing without revealing it to his servants, the prophets. Every time he gets ready to destroy Israel, he talks to Moses about it. Why did he do that? If he really meant business, he would have just have done it. And Moses would have suddenly looked around and been the only one there. But he wanted salvation for those people. So anyway, let's see. He said, I'm going to do it just like I did in the day of Moses. And I'm going to dis destroy them all and leave you alive. Okay. He's going to start over with you. Okay. Notice Moses' response. And Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why doth, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people? In other words, they're not my people. They're thy people. <laughs> Which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand. 
Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say for mischief? Did he bring them out and slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against the people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and saidest unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven. And all this land that I have spoken of, I will give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. Verse 14. And Moses turned, and the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. Okay. What has happened here? Did God change his mind? God actually was drawing Moses out to stand in the gap for that nation. It was not Moses that put some kind of pressure, what did they call it in wrestling, you know, some kind of hold on the Lord, you know, and forcing him to do, remember, you're going to see this. No, it was actually... God looking for a man to stand in the gap. He needed someone to stand there and to take responsibility for that people. It was God that had moved on the heart of Moses to stand there. You see, God looked for a man to stand in the gap and he found one. Now, like I said, if God really wanted to destroy them, he would have done it. He didn't have to come and discuss it with Moses. Okay. And Moses understood for this. He, uh, he repented for his brethren. He answered to God for them. Again in Numbers 14 we see the same thing. And we're just going to look at a couple of more scriptures with Moses. They get more and more gripping. In Numbers 14 the Israelites anger had angered God. They refused to go into the promised land. Remember that? Again, God proposes to Moses that they all be destroyed and he start all over again with him. But the great heart of this man, Moses, is seen. Let's look at verse 15 in Numbers 14. And, and now if thou shalt kill all this people as one man, then the nations which have heard the fame of thee will speak, saying, Because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land which he sware unto them. Therefore he hath slain them in the wilderness. And now I beseech thee, let the power of the Lord be great, according as thou hast spoken, as thou hast spoken saying, The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. Pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of this people according unto the greatness of thy mercy. And as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. Mark this in your Bibles, the next verse. And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word. We need to understand this verse. It is one of the most crucial passages in scriptures for us who want to begin to stand in the gap for people. I have a pardon according to thy word. Somehow, you know, the tenuous balance of the scales of divine justice and divine mercy, God accepted this intercession of Moses as the single factor that allowed him to hold back a judgment on a nation that was really due to get it. Back in Ezekiel's day, God looked for someone and he didn't find one. Today he found one again. Moses understood something that we need to understand according to the biblical pattern. We can repent for a people, and we can call for grace and mercy for them. God said, I have pardoned according to your word. Can we learn this from the man most like Christ, the man who knew God face to face? A nation was spared by the word of one man. How many of our families are tormented by the works of darkness because someone did not take the place like Moses did at the head of their family? Moses said, no, Lord, I stand responsible for them. And as Jesus stands before God in our behalf, ever making intercession for us, we must stand before him for our fellows also. How many things happen because we didn't take a position of authority over things that want to come against our children, against our house, households. 
And we can say, Lord, I forbid this thing in my home. Lord, I drive that spirit out of this house. There'll be no curse in my home. There'll be no sickness in my home. As believers, we have a call upon us to stand in behalf of our family, our pastors, our churches, our cities, our nations. And God promises in 2 Chronicles 7.14, we know it. But did you see this in it? The most amazing part of this scripture it says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and will heal their land. What is the most amazing thing in that scripture? The most amazing thing is this. He's speaking to a people. He's not speaking to a nation. He says, if my people in that nation will do this, I will heal the whole thing. You know, he doesn't see how many people. I believe if there are 10 in a nation, God says, if my people in that nation would do these things, then I will hear and will heal that land. Whether it's by many or few. God saves by many and God saves by few. Okay. That's what Jonathan said. Okay. I like that. If you can find just a few, he'll save all the rest of it just because of that few. So we have to understand the very crucial role we play as Christians and how dramatically we can affect everything that is around us. We have a role in our society. Let us wake up to it. And I don't care, you know, how infirm we are. If we can't go to nations, man, we can change nations. And we'll see in my last, last session what I think about intercession. I mean, I tell you, I'm not going to stop going to the nations, but I, tell you, I am never going to stop being an intercessor. I think it is the most critical calling that we can have. Okay, remember though, I'm recruiting intercessors in this course. That's my whole purpose. Okay, okay. Now we're going to look at number 16. Number 16, going back to numbers. And it says, in number 16, there is another rebellion against Moses. This time, the people are trying to undermine his role of leadership. It's called the rebellion of Korah. Korah is a Levite. And he claims, how, how much longer do I have? A lot of time or a little time? How many? It doesn't matter. Okay, good. Okay. He's a Levite. And he claims that he should be a leader too. Because Moses was a Levite. As if that was the only th reason that God chose him. You know. This begins to cause a ferment. And there comes a major rebellion. And it's led by Korah and his followers. Now you might think it might be several hundred people. You know. I mean that's what I'm sure Moses and Aaron thought. God tells Moses, we will have a demonstration. The people will see whom I have chosen. So tell them to come together tomorrow, and I'll demonstrate this for all the people to see. So the next day they all gather out in this field, and Kor and his cohorts call out to Moses saying, you're not the rightful leader. We have the right to do what we want to do too, you know. So let's look at verse 20. And, and the Lord spake unto Moses and to Aaron, saying, Separ Get away from him. <laughs> Separate yourselves from among this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. And they fell upon their faces and said, O God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin, wilt that be wroth with the whole congregation? The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the congregation, saying, Get you up from a about the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiam. And Moses rose up and went unto Nathan and Abiam, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spake unto the congregation, saying, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs, lest ye be consumed in all their sins. So they got up from the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiam on every side, and Dathan and Abiam came out and stood in the doors of their tents, and their wives, and their sons, and their little children. 
And Moses said, Hereby you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do these works, for I have not done them of my own mind. If these men die the com common death of all men, or if they are visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. But if the Lord make a new thing, yes. and the earth open her mouth and swallow them up with all that pertain unto them, and they go down quick into the pit, then ye shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. And it came to pass, as he had made an end of speaking these words, that the ground clave asunder and was, that was under them, and the earth swallowed her mouth, I mean, so opened her mouth and swallowed them up in their houses, and all the men that appertained unto Korah and their goods, they and all that appertained unto them went down alive into the pit, and the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. And all Israel that were around about them fled at the cry of them, for they said, Lest the earth swallow us up also. And there came out a fire from the Lord and consumed 250 men that offered incense. So if he thought it was a few people, it was not a few people. Okay. Now, but after that, after this display of God's confirming Moses' role as leadership, something happens the next day that is so perverse, we can hardly believe it. So we're going to read in verse 41. And this is the place when I come to this portion of scripture that I really wish that it said Jesus had the tongue of the learned. I wish I had that tongue. I would love to be able to share what really happened in the heart of this man the way it should be shared. But I'll do what I can do. Verse 41. But on the morrow... All the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, saying, Ye have killed the people of the Lord. And it came to pass, when the congregation was gathered against Moses and against Aaron, that they looked toward the tabernacle of the congregation, and behold, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared. And Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of the congregation, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Get you from among this congregation, that I may consume them as in a moment. And they fell upon their faces. In Exodus 32, we saw that Moses prayed and God relented. In Moses, I mean in Numbers 14, Moses prayed and God said, I've pardoned them according to your word. But now after these events of the day before, Moses seems to have no heart or no confidence and no ability, not knowing how to approach God to seek mercy for these horrible people. It's not, it's as if he almost dares not to ask God to spare them one more time. It's like he is fearful. Remember, there came a place with Abraham when he dared not go any further. When he said, if you'll spare it for ten, God said, I'll spare it for ten. Abraham stopped. Moses did not stop. He didn't stop. He went on. What did he do? Verse 46, And Moses said unto Aaron, Take a censer, and put fire therein from off the altar, and put on incense, and go quickly into the congregation, and make an atonement for them, for there is wrath gone out from me. For the Lord, the plague is begun. And Aaron took as Moses commanded, and ran into the midst of the congregation. And behold, the plague was begun among the people. And he put on incense and made an atonement for the people. And he stood between the dead and the living, and the plague was stayed. Now there died in that plague, they that died in that plague were 14,700, beside them that died about the matter of Korah. And Aaron returned unto Moses and to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and the plague was stayed. I think it's one of the most dramatic things in Scripture. Moses has no words to say, so he says, just get the incense. Go to the altar, get a censer, and wave the incense. You, 
We all know, and he knew, incense was a type of prayer. He had lost his words, but not his heart. And that act of worship became a heart cry beyond words. And already the people were dying. They were terrified, and they were crying and screaming, and death was on every side, and panic. But here's, this is Aaron's finest hour. He had never, not always been the good sidekick that Moses needed. But here we see that he rises to a dimension. He never rose again. As I said, it's his finest hour. He takes that incense and he runs into the face of that plague. People dying all around him. And wherever he goes of that incense forming a cloud floating behind him, the people on one side lived and the people on the other side died. He had laid down his life for the people. It said there was a line between the living and the dead. Okay, he made a division. The solemn act of worship was seen as a heartfelt intercession by God. All right, this was not God changing his mind. It was the power of God investing in his people again. So we can have a partnership with God. We can say, Lord, as you set me in front of a nation, we can draw the line between the living and the dead. Sometimes, you know, when there are terrible hurricanes and tornadoes coming, remember this. You can establish a line between the living and the dead. God wants you to realize that a lot of the natural disasters we take from the hand of God are from the prince of the power of the air. That's where weather is made. Okay. So the fullest meaning of standing in the gap is to block the worst judgment that is both just and true and fully deserved from coming on a certain people. This is what Jesus did for us. While we were yet the, in his enemies, sworn enemies, he died for us. The Lord wants us to understand this. We are in partnership with him in this world. Partners and priests in grace and mercy. It says in 1 Peter 4.10, Something that I think we haven't understood, and I want to bring it out before we close. First Peter 4.10, As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. We read that. What does that mean? Stewards of God's grace. What did a steward do? Who remembers what a steward did in the New Testament? We read about the bad steward, the good steward. He handled and dealt with the master's riches. He paid the people that need to be paid, those that brought the goods to the house. He handled the, I mean, what, he was like a business administrator. Right, thank you. And so what is grace? If we're administrators of God's grace, what is God's grace? I like the definition in Hebrews 4.16. Grace is help. Let's read it. I don't have it in the syllabus, but I'll read it really fast here. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain help. Uh, mercy and help, find grace to help in time of need. Okay, what is the definition of grace? It is help. Like, help! <laughs> okay, it's help. Whatever kind of help you need. It could be financial, it could be health, it could be any kind of help. Grace is help. It comes in all these forms. And we're stewards of it. God expects us to minister this help, which is God's grace, out to the people that we see and we feel burdened that need it. That's a wonderful promise for us. He's made us stewards. As good wise stewards, we can have control over the riches of the Father's house. Just like a natural steward had control over the wealth of his master's house. Well, we have better riches than they did. And we're good stewards of it. And God wants us to dispense it wisely but abundantly, so it, it can fill this earth. This is a great part of ruling and reigning with Christ. T.D. Jakes, I love that man. <laughs> and um, after the terrorist attacks in New York, he said something. 
Many voices said the terrorist attacks had brought the United States down to her knees. Well, T.D. Jakes had this to say. He said, well, maybe so, but on our knees is the best position from which we can rule and reign. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. How much time do we have? Any? Okay. Um, we're going to pray. And we're going to draw a line in the sand and say to the enemy, no more. I think every one of us in here has a line that we need to draw. Uh, I have a line, lion, line. Not a lion, but a line to draw. And I'll tell you very, very fast. I have a grandson, and I have a special kind of feeling of responsibility for him. Um, when he was in the womb, well, before he was conceived, his mother had had a miscarriage, my daughter Stephanie, and her heart was broken. And so I went and laid hands on her, and I realized that the only best thing I could pray is that God would give her another child. I mean, she was literally, she had a little boy, but she was heartbroken. So I prayed that she would conceive again. Well, very quickly she did. And I was ministering out of the state. I think I was up in Georgia. And suddenly in the middle of the night, the pastor, I was staying with a pastor and his family. The phone rang and I was thinking, poor pastors, they get calls all night long. And suddenly there was a knock on my door and they said, Miss uh, Sister Lewis, the, phone, the call is for you. And I said, oh my. And it was my daughter, Stephanie. And she was hysterical. And she was saying, Mama, I'm losing this baby too. What can I do? And I tell you, the power of God came on me. And I prayed a prayer. It will sound absolutely ridiculous. But I promise you, it was under the anointing of God. And I prayed. But then I began to speak to that uterus. And I said, I was angry. And I said, you uterus, stop killing my grandchildren. <laughs> and I command you now to hold that child and not let him out. You know. And anyway, I mean, my daughter, she was crying. And she stopped. I guess she was shocked. Anyway, I said, now, Stephanie, go to bed. She was in college. They were in Gainesville, Florida. And they were both students, married students. And um, I said, you go to bed. Do not clean up that apartment because I'm coming. Because that's what she did. When Mama was coming, she would try to get everything right. right. Don't you dare. So as I drove from Georgia to Gainesville. I got there the middle of the next day, and she was up, and sure enough, she was polishing things. I said, Stephanie, I told you to go to bed and stay. She said, Mama, I'm fine. The minute you prayed, I stopped bleeding. I'm fine. And so anyway, we rejoiced, and I went on ministering in different places. And the baby was supposed to come. I guess it was supposed to come in September. Anyway. No, it was supposed to come in October. And so I was over in France. And uh, I called home to see if the baby had come. And she said, no, Mama, he hadn't come yet. And I heard this little voice saying, you've got to release that womb. Yeah. I said, oh, no. Oh, no. That's just me. So I was, you know, anyway, anyway, every time I would share about telling that womb to not kill my children and commanding it to hold him, that little voice would say, you've got to open that womb. So I called home again. And my daughter, she sounded like her lip was dragging on the ground. She said, no, Mama, <laughs> I haven't. So anyway, I said, oh, my goodness. So I went home, I went straight to Gainesville, I laid hands on her and commanded that uterus, it's okay now, let that baby out. <laughs> I mean, you can imagine how silly I felt, but I did it. And within like the next few hours, she went into labor. Well, because of that, I feel like I have, sort of, you know what they used to say, if you save one, someone's life, you're responsible for them. Okay, well this grandson, Obviously, I always felt like I had a call on him. And there was a time when he was in his early teens, when he was a musician. He was in our adult worship team, just there with the major musicians. You know who Kent Henry is? He came to our church several times. He fell in love with my grandson and said he was so anointed. And something happened that broke Nicholas's heart. I will not go into it, except that he felt like he had been greatly double-crossed by all the youth team and everything else. And so 
he backslid. And recently the Lord's been speaking to me to do exactly what I've been telling you, to restrain those devils and to let him remember the sweetness of the Lord and that he will come back. I know there probably, probably there's a call on him. He's a musician. He wants, and right now all he wants to do is play the world's music. But he needs to remember, I don't care. I just want him back with God, you know. And I'm not telling him what to do. I just want his spirit and God's spirit to be entwined as they once were. So what we're going to do is draw a line. And we will lift our hands and say, Lord, we want you to pour out your grace upon that person. And call for a line of life. In, from the death, I'm sorry, we draw a line between life and death on some of these people. We can do it with loved ones, or maybe you want to do it for certain leaders, or maybe you want to do it for our nation. Heaven knows it needs it. Okay, so now let's just at call on God and draw that line between the living and the dead. And we'll just end with this. You can cut off the tape now if you like. And Father, just lift your hands and pray with me. Heavenly Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, we come before you in behalf of these needs. And Father, as I come before you in behalf of Nicholas, Lord, I know everyone here is coming before you in behalf of someone dear to their hearts, some situation that is troubling them. And Father, as you, as Moses drew a line between the living and the dead, let us this hour draw a line, Father. And we say, enemy, you will go no further. You will proceed no further. You will do no more. And Father, I personally take authority over the demonic forces that are clouding the soul of my grandson. And I break your power over him. And I say, you'll speak to him no more. You'll talk to him no more. I command you to be silent in the name of Jesus. And Holy Spirit, I call upon you. Come down. Come down upon that child. Cause the spirit that's in him to rise up. And let him remember the sweetness of the Lord. And I thank you, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, for saving him, calling him back from the edge, Father, calling him back from the brink of destruction. Devil, you're not going to have him. He belongs to Jesus. And I thank you, Father, for restoring his soul tonight. Even tonight, Father, let that child come back into the kingdom. And I thank you, Father. And Father, I agree with these other intercessors that, Lord, they draw this line and I stand with them upon that line and I say, devil, you will not cross over. We put the blood upon it and we bind your power and we forbid you to do anything else in these situations. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. <coughs> Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Tomorrow is my day off.